Hey, welcome back. We're going to be continuing our discussion through some of the different functions of business uh, with a brief stop here talking about business formation. A uh, very important concept in business is really how you're going to form and start your particular company. And as we go over, you have a number of different options at your disposal, some better than others. But the important thing to consider is that there really isn't one uh, best way of forming a particular business. It really depends on a number of different variables and hopefully we'll get into that a little bit over the course of today's lecture. So first, really, why does business formation matter? Who really cares how a, or a company organizes itself? Um, there's a number of different reasons why you should care about this. Um, the first of which is your costs. Depending upon the structure that you set up for your business, your organization, whatever, um, there are certain costs that go alongside that. So, for example, if you were to set up what we call a sole proprietorship, those are very inexpensive. There's not a very significant amount of uh, fees that you're paid up front. Uh, there's not a great deal of maintenance fees or any for that matter. Uh, compared to something of a corporation where you have a lot of upfront fees and you have continual fees and reporting things in different different items of that nature. So there is a cost associated with that. Obviously in line with that also is you have regulations. Depending upon the structure that you choose for your business, you will have to follow certain government regulations. And depending upon the structure, some are more strict than others. And we're going to get into some of the differences in how some of those regulations play a factor, but it is very important to consider. Next are taxes. Uh, taxes are a common theme, obviously, in business. You know, obviously, many uh, goals of business are to try and minimize taxes, tax shelters, those different types of things. Uh, so depending upon the structure, you will have different tax implications, which can be important, obviously, because all of these things together affect ultimately what your profits are ultimately what you take home. Now, if you're spending a lot of money in regulations, obviously spending more money in taxes, and you have more expenses in terms of starting the formation of your business, that's going to result in reduced profits. And so that's really why you want to key in on what type of structure to choose. Now, there are a number of different types of structures you can choose uh, when forming your particular business. And we're going to get into some of the more common ones. Uh, there are others that are less common, uh, that are a little bit more detail oriented, a little more specific, um, tend to encompass maybe a, a select fewer number of people. We're going to go over the more kind of big picture, uh, larger type uh, formation structures that we'll go over today. So we're going to stick to kind of the bigger things and not go into so much of the smaller details with some of the less common types of formation here. So. So let's talk about the different types. Uh, I'm going to try not to go into too much detail because we're going to talk about these in subsequent slides later on. Um, I have a tendency, once I see something, to try and go off on a tangent and discuss it as, as detailed as possible, which isn't good when we get to the point to where we're supposed to go into detail. So I'm going to try and be a little uh, brief here uh, for the most part. Uh, so starting with the first, we have a sole proprietorship. Uh, sole proprietorship is a business that is owned by one person. So if you want to start your own company, uh, you can form a sole proprietorship and you would be the sole proprietor, essentially. Uh, very, very easy way of starting a business. More to come on that front. Next is a partnership. Partnerships work very similarly to a sole proprietorship. The only difference is there are two people, typically, as opposed to one. Uh, there can be more than two. Uh, if you're asking that question, uh, but there has to be at least two for there to be a, be a partnership. And partnerships are a little tricky, and we're going to go over why they're a little tricky and, and honestly what you can do to overcome maybe that disadvantage. Next we have is a corporation. Uh, corporations, you've probably heard this terminology before if you've been involved uh, in any way, shape, or form around business or even paid a little bit of attention to what's going on in the news. Uh, corporations are separate legal entities. They essentially are almost in the eyes of the law as a separate person. 
Uh, so what that means is they can hold property in the name of the corporation, they can sue people, they can be sued just like a person can. Uh, and so there are advantages and disadvantages associated with that as well that we'll get into later on. And the next thing you have is a limited liability company, uh, commonly referred to as LLCs. You also have LLPs, which are limited liability partnerships. Uh, LLCs are really a hybrid. Uh, they combine some advantages of a sole proprietorship with some of the advantages of a corporation and trying to minimize a lot of the regulations that corporations have to adhere to, but also take into account. Uh, advantage of the limited liability aspect, which is a significant advantage of a corporation that we'll talk about in more detail later on. So just to give you kind of an overview of really how common these types of, uh, of structures are for the most part, or types of forms of ownership, if you will, uh, sole proprietorships by far are the most common, and you're going to find out why very quickly. However, if you're going to look at the actual net income that is drawn out by that form of ownership, it's very, very small. So you have a lot of sole proprietors uh, responsible for a small percentage of the net income or of the profits uh, of those particular companies. Now, corporations, of course, comprise a little bit of a smaller piece, not as small as, as partnerships, but obviously much smaller than a sole proprietorship, but they are responsible for a lion's share of the actual, uh, of the actual profits. All right, so let's talk about a sole proprietorship. Like I said before, a sole proprietorship involves one person who's in charge of the business, okay? And this has a lot of advantages. Uh, first and foremost, very, very easy to set up. If you wanted to start a sole proprietorship, there is literally very minimal forms you would have to complete. Uh, really, we're talking about a DBA or doing business as in which you would formally file that with the state, a few other forms, and, and really not a whole lot of paperwork. Uh, very, very simple to do. You wouldn't necessarily need to get uh, attorneys involved if you did not want to, if you were trying to avoid that cost. Uh, so very, very easy to set up. Uh, not a whole lot of red tape. Um, another advantage is there's a retention of control. You know, it's just you at the helm. So ultimately, the company is going to go in the direction that you choose. If you want to uh, explore a certain market opportunity, then that's completely up to you. There's no one that's going to go against you and going to say, hey, this isn't a bad idea. So depending upon your position, you might take that as advantage or disadvantage, of course, depending upon, well, I really want someone there to give me some feedback and to tell me when I'm talking crazy because that does happen. You also have a sense of pride of ownership. Uh, there's this sense of you against the world. I've started my own company. I'm the sole proprietor. I've, you know, bootstrapped and pulled myself up and and with the resources that I had, I've made it happen through my own wits and my own will essentially. And there's there's definitely that sense of pride as a result of that and that can't be understated with the sole proprietorship. Next thing is you have is a retention of profits. Uh, very, very important. You're not necessarily splitting profit between a number of different partners, uh, but you're retaining that uh, for yourself. Uh, one thing also to note, and this kind of coincides with the possible tax advantages of a sole proprietorship, is that you're taxed on your personal rate. And what that means is that annually when you get ready to file your tax returns for the prior year, you would claim any business revenue or sales as income on your part. Uh, so let's say, for example, your business netted you know, $50,000. Well, if you had maybe a day job, you would add that $50,000 to your own income. So you get taxed on your own personal rate. And for a lot of people, that offers some advantages compared to some other forms uh, because you generally are taxed at a lower rate than potentially some corporations, although there can be obviously some differences and some exceptions there. But that is certainly um, arguably a, a significant benefit there. All right, now there are several disadvantages, uh, very, very important ones, which I'll get into kind of the big picture ones. Uh, first is you have limited financial resources. And what I mean by that is if you're only one person, 
you're the only person that's going to be putting forth any type of financial resources, whether it's a savings account, cashing out a 401k, pulling equity out of a home, any of those avenues that you choose. We'll get into some of the, the nuances of financing a business when we talk about entrepreneurship next week. But you're in a sole proprietorship, you're the only person that's putting forth uh, any type of uh, money whatsoever, which you know, if you are blessed financially, then that may not be somewhat of an issue. But like, if you're like most people, then that may be somewhat daunting to come up with a significant amount of money, depending upon, you know, what are the financial requirements of your particular business there. So that is one thing to consider. Uh, one thing I will also mention on top of that is if you are to try and get funding from, let's say, a financial institution like a bank or credit union, it's much more difficult to get financing as a sole proprietorship than it is a sole part, uh, a partnership or a corporation. And the reason for that is that bank is pretty much betting on you that you're going to have what it takes to make that business successful and ultimately to make sure that you can continue to pay on that loan that you're going to be taking out. And if you're one person, you know, maybe the maybe the bank is is just not sure on you. Maybe they like the business idea. They think that's going to work, but they're just a little bit concerned about maybe you don't have the skill set necessary, right? If you're only one person, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of hats you have to wear there. Uh, so that may be a little bit of a concern. Partnerships tend to have a little bit of an easier time with funding from banks and those different types of financial institutions because there are more players involved. So maybe if one person lacks a certain skill set, the other partner maybe has that particular piece, which can be very beneficial. All right, probably one of the biggest disadvantages of a sole proprietorship is this idea of unlimited liability. And what that means um, well, first and foremost, um, the business and the sole proprietor are essentially one, okay? Uh, and so obviously that has the benefit in terms of tax advantages, potentially claiming the business income as your own uh, income essentially on your tax return. But in the event, let's say that your company gets sued, you and the business are one person. That business is not a separate legal entity. So what that does is that puts you on the hook, for any potential liability. So if your business, let's say, for example, manufactures some type of product and for some reason they find that the product's unsafe and so there's a lawsuit against your particular company, under a sole proprietorship, you could be held personally liable, which means that if the business does not have all of the resources necessary to meet the demands of the lawsuit, those particular people can go after you. And that includes all of your possessions, your home, cars, any type of assets they can get a hold of to attempt to recover what may be rightfully theirs. And so that is a significant disadvantage and a very significant risk that you have to weigh when deciding whether or not you actually want to go ahead and choose a sole proprietorship because there are some benefits, of course. You know, you do have the ability to set them up rather easily, but there is that trade-off. Now, one thing you should consider is it depends on what you're doing because some jobs are inherently riskier than others. So maybe setting up a corporation under in all situations might be overkill. It might not be necessary. But if you are in maybe a higher risk industry or higher risk profession, something where you have a little bit more liability, then probably the sole proprietorship isn't going to be the best route for you, but you have to kind of gauge that on your own. All right, another disadvantage is sole proprietorships really have a very difficult time attracting uh, top talent. And I mean talented employees, labor, your workforce, right? One of the factors of production. Without quality employees that are skilled, the business does not work. Uh, so as a sole proprietorship, it's very difficult to because you're trying to buy in to one person and their ideology, their mission, their values, and it gets difficult for there to be a fit there. Um, so it's much harder to attract people because honestly, put yourself in their position, right? If you're looking for a job, you're probably looking for something that is somewhat challenging, but you also want a little bit of probably sustainability, longevity something that you're going to be around for a while. You don't want to be searching for a job another three months because the business is going under. And so those are concerns that people have when they're 
potentially going to start a company uh, or start or join a company that is a sole proprietorship because it is smaller. So obviously it is at greater risk for potentially failing, of course. All right, next disadvantage. Uh, heavy workload and responsibilities. Early on, you're the only person. And so that means you're doing the bookkeeping, you're handling the sales and marketing, you're handling production, you're dealing with customers, you're taking care of the books, all those different things. You have a lot of responsibilities. And if you're like most people, you probably aren't good at all of those different things. Maybe you're competent, you're somewhat capable at looking at an income statement or a balance sheet, but you're not quite sure how to do the bookkeeping piece with all the different credits and debits and charts and things. That might be not not be your skill set, and that's completely okay, right? Uh, seldomly do we have all the skills necessary to do things. That's why we surround ourselves with people that do. Um, but initially, in the early stages, that can be a very big burden, is trying to uh, kind of carry the whole thing, if you will, and, and tackling all those responsibilities. Uh, next thing before we move on is a lack of permanence. And what that means is that when the, the sole proprietor, when the person running the business ends up passing away, uh, the business essentially ends at that point. Um, there is no continuation uh, because remember, the sole proprietor and the business are essentially one person. So obviously the business can't survive if the sole proprietor is no longer around. So that is a definite disadvantage as well. All right, let's talk about partnerships. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is general partnerships. There are two different kinds to make it a little more confusing for you, uh, but I'm going to go over these in, in some fair detail here, so hopefully it should elaborate on them. Um, so let's talk about general partnerships first before we get into limited partnerships. Uh, general partnerships, of course, uh, are partnerships involving obviously two or more people, they have a number of different advantages, um, first of which is you can pull your financial resources. Remember that this was a disadvantage of a sole proprietorship. You only have one person committing the financial resources, the financial backing. But with a partnership or general partnership, you now have multiple people that are putting forth their resources uh, so it can go a lot further and potentially fund the business even further than it already has. You also have shared responsibilities. This is a very, very big thing here. Uh, it's no longer just one person. It's you, a friend of yours, whoever that you found that has some skill set. And now you can share the burden. You're dividing the responsibilities up, allowing your you guys to focus on what you're really good at, kind of your core competencies. Because if you're not that great at sales, chances are we don't want you in front of customers. And that's okay because not everyone is good at everything. Uh, the important thing is to have an honest conversation with yourself and know that, you know, what are you good at? Do a reasonable self-assessment and see these are my strengths and weaknesses. Obviously, we want to improve on the weaknesses, but, you know, we don't want to necessarily shy away from our strengths either. Next thing is they are easy to form as well. A little more complex. And the only reason I say a little more complex is because you have to do some work to outline how the profits are going to be split up. Uh, and this needs to be documented. No handshake agreements, no verbal agreements. This needs to be something that is set in stone. How do you handle things like splitting profits? Uh, how do you handle certain situations like when one partner wants out and one doesn't? Um, those are things that are going to come up and so they need to be addressed. Uh, partnerships are very difficult for this reason and so you want to lay everything out there in writing to make sure that there isn't going to be a situation that you're not prepared for. Next thing is tax advantages and, and similar to sole proprietorships, a tax advantage is for general partnerships in that you can claim that there's a pass through into your own personal income which can have some advantages as well. All right, now disadvantages. You're going to see some common themes here with uh, partnerships and sole proprietorships. A First off, a disadvantage here for a general partnership is you have unlimited liability. Very similarly to the sole proprietorship, you have unlimited liability here, meaning that the partners can be on the hook for the debts of the business. Now, where it gets even more tricky is either partner can be responsible for the other's 
uh, others' operations or others' actions, if you will. Uh, and so that's extremely troubling because maybe your partner goes out and signs up for a bunch of different loans and the business name and all these other things, and now you're on the hook for those potentially. And what happens to is that banks, creditors, suppliers, people that are filing lawsuits, they're going to go after the person that has the deepest pockets. And if that's you, even if you didn't necessarily enter into the agreement, because it's a general partnership, you could be on the hook as well. So that has to be considered too. And that's, like I said, why you need to document these things very heavily. Uh, and that's the risk that you take by starting a, uh, starting a general partnership. Uh, next, of course, is lack of continuity uh, or lack of permanence, if you will, similar to the last section here. And what that is, is if the general partner dies, then the partnership essentially is no longer a partnership, right? You need two or more people, and the people that were supposed to be in the partnership are not all there fully, and so the partnership dissolves. Now, of course, if you have something written to a actual binding agreement that tells you how you're going to handle that situation, then that may get you around that disadvantage. But it is still a disadvantage worth mentioning. Uh, and next, we talked about drawing up a partnership agreement. There can be some difficulty with that, right? Who's going to commit what resources? Uh, how are we going to divide the particular profits? What happens when someone wants to sell and someone doesn't? Those are all things that you do want to go through when you want to have a realistic conversation and just lay it all out there. Um, some people are really afraid and, and kind of uneasy about having those conversations, but you really need to because it truthfully can save you a lot of headache early on. Um, I've always had the mentality that I, I don't like partnerships. Uh, even with uh, agreements, agreements make it a little easier, but I, I just, there's a lot of uh, variables and different things that can be a little tricky and it gets very difficult to manage. And, and if, you know, if you know anything obviously about people, it's that we are uh, very, very, I wouldn't say unreliable, but, you know, it's, it, it, we're always changing. And so what, what is, you know, a decision one day isn't the decision the next day. And so that's, that's one of the things to consider. All right. Now I, I alluded to limited partnerships as well, and these are very similar to a general partnership, but with a little bit of a twist. Okay. Um, now a limited partnership uh, involves general partners. So people that carry the risk, but they also incorporate what are called limited partners. Okay. Uh, and so a limited partner commits financial resources, but is only liable for the resources that they committed. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say that you want to go ahead and start a company and you're going to be the general partner. You're going to make all the business decisions, but you don't have any money. Well, I come along and I have money. Let's, let's just say that I do. And you ask me, say, Hey, you know what, Matt, if you commit uh, $10,000, I can multiply your uh, your investment sevenfold and I think hey this is a really good idea why wouldn't I take this of course it sounds like a no brainer so I agree I sign on as a limited partner what that means is I've invested my ten thousand dollars I give it to you you decide what to do with it okay I in turn if everything goes south the business goes under everyone sues you to try to get money they can't go after me I'm only liable for that ten thousand dollars so obviously I lose my investment but they're not going after my house or my other assets or anything else. So that is certainly a benefit is that you're being able to invest, but you're not incurring all of the risk. Okay. Now the general partner still incurs all of the risk. Okay. And they make all the decisions, right? And rightfully so. They're the ones taking the majority of the risk. So they're entitled to make the decisions and decide what they want to do. As a limited partner, I have very little say over what happens. I merely am sort of the financial backer, if you will. And we also have limited liability partnerships. Okay. And these obviously are like partnerships are with general partnerships, but more than obviously two or more people. Uh, and so you can actually start these as well. Same type of, of theme that I mentioned before. Uh, limited liability partnerships aren't very common. You see them mostly in uh, law offices, uh, sometimes with accounting firms. Uh, 
uh, maybe some engineering architectural firms, but outside of that, you don't see them that much. Um, those are really, they're very limited to those disciplines, uh, and the amount of liability will differ based upon the state that you're in. You're going to find that certain states are more generous in terms of business uh, or handling of business transactions and formations and those types of things than others. All right, next we're going to get into corporations. Uh, corporations, as I said before, are something you're probably familiar with. You can look at all of the little logos here and images on the right-hand side of your screen, and those are some of the most common corporations or more, uh, most recognizable corporations. Uh, and a corporation, as I mentioned before, is a separate legal entity. Uh, separate from its owners and that provides a lot of different benefits because if the corporation gets sued I'm protected essentially because the corporation is a separate entity they can't go after me personally if uh, unless of course it was something that I did personally and I was acting irresponsibly uh, so a corporation is a separate legal entity the most common type of corporation is a C corporation uh, when anyone says corporation they're generally referring to what is called a C corporation although we don't use that terminology very often but they are used interchangeably that's what they mean uh, and the requirements for corporations vary um, you're gonna find that a lot of corporations interestingly enough or a lot of companies are incorporated in Delaware uh, Delaware is a very corporation friendly state uh, they provide a lot of different advantages and benefits to incorporating it in that state so they can obviously raise uh, taxes and those types of things and raise revenues um, so that is you'll see a lot of companies are incorporated in Delaware uh, very very common now uh, when you get into the structure Corporations are owned by stockholders, so people that actually invest in that particular company. And usually the first thing that you have to do if you were to file for a corporation status uh, is you have to file an Articles of Incorporation. Um, and include bylaws and all those different things and we're getting a little too specific, but just so you know kind of the process and everything, what that entails. Now before we go uh, any further, let's talk about how the corporation is structured. Okay, so when you start a corporation, you obviously file your articles of incorporation and all your bylaws, and you have to set up what's called a board of directors. Okay, and a board of directors is designed to represent the interests of the stockholders. Okay, um, they are designed to give stockholders a voice because obviously stockholders can't come in and say, "Hey, you know what? I really want you guys to do this." Uh, that would be very chaotic and it wouldn't be a very smooth running operation. So instead, you can elect a board of directors. And if you own stock in a company, which stock, although we haven't gotten to this portion in the, in the course yet, uh, stock is essentially a uh, form of ownership of a company, right? You're purchasing stock. It entitles you to uh, certain benefits, most notably Obviously, you're entitled to a claim on assets potentially, uh, but you're also entitled to voting rights. Uh, so let's say, let's take a corporation here. Let's take Walmart. And let's say you have stock in Walmart. Okay, so Walmart trading roughly, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but somewhere around $71, $72 per share, at least at the date of this recording. And you have several shares. Um, so each share that you have entitles you to voting rights. Okay. And so what that does is if there's a board open for, um, a, or we're opening it for voting for a board, uh, you can take your shares and you can vote who you want to be on the board if you have a number of options. Usually it's a yes or no for a vote. Uh, so you can actually go ahead and vote. And what you're doing is you're voting for the person that you feel is most likely to represent your interests, is going to act in your own best interest because the board is going to represent you uh, in discussing things with top management. So it's very important to have a very good board of directors. Now, the role of the board of directors isn't to do anything involved with the day-to-day. -day. They're not responsible for making decisions about products and, and different things. Um, they're responsible for really just overseeing that things are going smoothly and protecting the interests of the investors or shareholders. Okay, Not involved with day-to-day, -day, may meet on a monthly, quarterly basis just to oversee how things are going, but they're not involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Another thing the board of directors do is they're responsible for appointing 
be corporate officers, people like the chief executive officer, chief financial officer, those types of things. Uh, they're involved with appointing, or at least somewhat involved in appointing those particular individuals. And they appoint them to manage the day-to-day -day operations. The CEO obviously is in charge of running the company, and so they're involved with the day-to-day. -day. Same thing with the CFO, the chief financial officer. They're involved with the financial aspect of the company very heavily. And so the board of directors appoints those particular individuals to actually run the day-to-day -day while they take a step back and really oversee everything to make sure things are going smoothly, checking in, um, obviously in charge of compensation for the corporate officers and those types of things. All right, now getting into the advantages and disadvantages here. First, let's talk about some of the advantages of corporations. Uh, the first major one is limited liability. Like I said before, if you have a corporation and your corp the company gets sued, but its form of ownership is a corporation status, they can only go after the corporation and the corporation's assets. They can't go after any of your own personal assets, which is a, a significant benefit. The next thing is permanence. Let's say if one of the the CEO of the company unfortunately passes away, uh, the corporation will continue to live on, and will they'll appoint another CEO and continue to operate. Uh, so it, it's not like in a sole proprietorship where if the owner passes away, the sole proprietorship or the business ends up going away. That isn't the same thing. Corporations will continue to operate. Same thing if a, a shareholder, a board of directors, if they unfortunately end up passing away, uh, the corporation will continue to exist. And so that's there is some continuity there. Uh, there also is uh, some, uh, some advantage in terms of how easy it is to transfer ownership. Okay, Remember that the owners of mainly corporations that are publicly traded, meaning you can purchase their stock on an exchange, the owners are actually shareholders, right? That entitles you to a percentage of ownership. And so if you wanted to transfer ownership, if you held that stock in Walmart and decided for whatever reason you didn't want to hold it, you felt like you could cash out and get a pretty good return on it, you could then go ahead and sell that uh, to someone else, and then you are now out of controller, you don't have ownership in that particular company, you no longer have a stake in them. Another advantage of corporations is it's a lot easier to raise money, a lot easier to raise capital. And that goes from a number of different things. Uh, first, in terms of debt, um, mostly corporations are usually larger, although not always. Remember, a corporation is just a piece of paper. Uh, it isn't the actual business. Uh, so something I should have clarified before, but keep that in mind. Uh, but corporations, a lot of them typically are larger companies, and so usually if you're larger, more successful, have some brand recognition, people know you, people know your products, it's going to be easier to raise money because you have a lot of financial records to support how much uh, revenue you're bringing in, how much profits you're bringing in. And so that means that people are a little less uh, are a little more likely to go ahead and lend you money. Uh, you can also issue shares, right, to shareholders. We'll talk more about how that's done when we talk about financial markets and financial management. And then next, you have specialized management. Okay, you have management for each particular function, everyone working on obviously what they do well. Um, there are a lot of specific functions available. You can have your CFO, your chief financial officer, your chief marketing officer, chief operations officer. Uh, there are now a lot of positions like chief information officer or uh, chief technology officer. And so you're really getting into more of the specialties here, each person having their own role, what they do well, and then focusing on that. So obviously not everything is merely just advantages. There are some disadvantages associated with a corporation. Uh, first of which is the expense. Uh, there are a lot of costs associated with filing for corporations up front. Uh, typically you get attorneys involved, which of course, as we all know, raises the costs of everything significantly. Uh, and they are more complex, more forms to fill out and all those other things. Uh, more regulations, different things like that. Uh, one of the primary disadvantages of corporations is this idea of double taxation. And really how that works, I'll explain that briefly, is when a, when a, a business earns money, okay, it sells products, customers purchase them, okay, it has to pay taxes on that eventually. Okay? And then 
when a company pays a dividend, it's taking that money that it's already paid taxes on and paying it to, let's say, you or I if we hold stock in a company. Okay. What we have to do is we have to then claim that money we received from the company as income. And that means that we have to claim it on our tax returns, and that means that it's taxed not at the same rate uh, as of right now. The dividends are usually taxed at about 15%, although there's talk about some of that being raised potentially. Uh, hopefully not, uh, but there is talk about that potentially. Uh, so there is that double taxation. The, the money gets taxed twice. The corporation gets taxed on it, and then you as the individual investor have to claim that as income, pay taxes as well. Uh, so that is a very significant disadvantage as well. Uh, next, you have a lot of paperwork and regulations. Uh, regulations meaning things you have to abide by. If you're a corporation uh, or if you're a publicly traded corporation, uh, you have to file a lot of financial statements with the Securities and Exchange Commission. There are a lot of different things you have to follow, which of course takes time, takes money, it takes resources. Uh, next, uh, there can be complications when operating in more than one state. Uh, simply because you are incorporated in one state, uh, you have to be uh, basically licensed to do business in other states as well, um, which can complicate matters. And then next you deal with conflicts of interest. And this we've seen happen more recently than late. Uh, unfortunately, we've talked about this in past lectures where uh, the management is primarily concerned with, let's say, short-term profits for the stake of, or for the sake of increasing the stock price uh, at the risk of, of long-term uh, profits. And so that's detrimental because as an investor, you really want the company to be set up in a way that it's going to be sustainable long term. Uh, you don't want necessarily just short term profits because then those go away and then you're left with nothing. Uh, but management, a lot of times, is paid in the form of stock options and in stock. And so they maybe have an interest in seeing that stock go up initially so they can essentially cash out uh, and then they're free and clear. Um, so those conflicts of interest do happen. You know, management has what's called a fiduciary duty, which means their duty is to act in the best interest of the shareholders. However, that sounds great on paper, but that doesn't always happen in real life, of course. All right, next we're going to go through a limited liability company. Okay, uh, Limited liability company, we've discussed these uh, originally before. It's kind of a hybrid, uh, has features of a sole proprietorship, also have features of a corporation. Uh, it's designed to take kind of the best of both worlds. Still has some disadvantages though, of course. Um, so some advantages. Uh, it does have limited liability, um, so you're not necessarily going to get sued on behalf of the business. Um, your personal assets would be protected, which is good. Um, they also have a benefit of a tax pass-through. And what that means is with limited liability, you can actually select which way you want to be taxed. You can have it taxed at your own personal rate, or you can have it taxed at, let's say, like a corporation-type rate, uh, whatever is more advantageous to you. So a little bit of flexibility there. Okay. Uh, next thing is you have simplified management and operation. You're not necessarily having to adhere to all of the requirements of a corporation in terms of the board of directors and all these different things and jumping through these hoops. Um, so you have very simplified operations there which are beneficial because that frees you up to really do what you do best and to focus on your business. And next, flexible ownership. I mentioned this before. Um, you can choose to be taxed at either an individual rate or to be taxed at a corporation rate, whatever is more advantageous to your personal situation. There are some disadvantages of, as well. Um, there is a little bit of complexity with the formation side, uh, which can obviously complicate things. Uh, you do have to pay taxes, of course, franchise taxes, which you pay usually on an annual basis. So that's a cost, of course, associated with that. Um, with an LLC, you also have foreign status in other states. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily entitle you to everything. You have to register with each of those individual states. They're also limited to select industries. As I stated before, you typically see them in the accounting profession. Typically, we'll see them in the law field as well. Um, so they're not widely available to a number of different professions. You usually see them in select industries. Okay. And also, there's a lot of differences by state, um, which is why you usually need to seek the 
uh, help of a, uh, a qualified legal professional because they can explain the differences to you uh, and obviously let you know where's best to go ahead and file the LLC. All right, now that we've gone over some of the basics of the, kind of the, the, the different types of business ownership, uh, let's talk about some of the more corporate themes here. Um, obviously, if you were a sole proprietorship or a partnership, uh, you might not be involved too much with mergers and acquisitions. This is more for corporations. Um, so we're going to go over what these are. This is a great way for companies to expand uh, into certain areas that maybe they don't originally operate, and I'm going to explain how that works here. Uh, so first we have mergers. Uh, mergers is when a two companies agree to combine uh, to form one company. Okay, so for example, you had Exxon and Mobil who merged together to form Exxon Mobil. Another more recent example is I believe in 2006, uh, GameStop, which is the, I think, the number one specialty video game retailer, uh, merged with Electronics Boutique, uh, EB Games, uh, to create one company. Uh, it was more of a merger, even though they, they followed under the name of, of GameStop, uh, but they adopted multiple different operations from the different businesses and that sort of thing there. So uh, another example of a more recent merger. Uh, next we have acquisitions. An acquisition is when one company simply buys the other, kind of absorbs their operations into its own business unit. An example of this is in 2011, Google bought Motorola Mobility, uh, which is the maker of, of cell phones and smartphones, uh, for about $12 billion. It might have been a little more than that, but roughly about $12 billion. Um, and so that gave Google, obviously, the ability to expand now into handsets, which is a big market they're trying to get into. Without having to create everything from the ground up, you acquire a company that's already in that particular business, uh, which gives you, obviously, the ability to be in that industry overnight. Now, there is a lot of importance with mergers and acquisitions, and I mentioned this before, uh, not only from a standpoint of trying to acquire competitors, um, and obviously you can't do that forever because eventually the uh, Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission is going to say, hey, you know what, you're limiting competition. You know, we don't want to allow this to happen. Kind of similar to what AT&T and T-Mobile, we talked about that in past weeks, how that, work, how that shook down. Uh, but another benefit not just from just growing bigger, is you can actually diversify into a lot of different areas. Okay, uh, Take, for example, Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks recently announced in 2011 they were, they were acquiring uh, the San Francisco Bay Area baker uh, La Boulangerie. Um, I believe it's La Boulangerie, something like that. I don't know exactly on the name there, but uh, very, very common San Francisco bakery, very popular, and Starbucks acquired them as a way to get into that type of market. Obviously, they didn't want to go through the hassle of trying to create everything because then people have to try it. Maybe they don't like it. Why not just buy an established bakery already that people already love and that gives you access to already all of those customers? What a great idea, right? They actually did something similarly where they actually purchased uh, not too long ago, maybe a year or two ago, uh, probably 2000, maybe 2011, uh, purchased a, a juice bar um, as a way of expanding as well. And so Starbucks is really trying to diversify away from just the coffee aspect. Um, just like when you're investing in stocks, you want to diversify, right? You don't want to hold everything into one in one company because that basically in, introduces more risk. And so that isn't something that's necessarily beneficial. So similar to that, when you run a business, you want to diversify in a number of different areas. So maybe coffee isn't strong. What if the co price of coffee beans goes up significantly and now your entire business is going under? Well, if you're diversified into juice and into baked goods, well, now you have those other businesses to kind of prop you up to make sure that overall you're sustainable and you can continue to operate. Another example, uh, in 2011, Facebook uh, purchased Instagram for $1 billion. Uh, many kind of argued that they paid a little too much there. But another example, Facebook purchased this not as a way to diversify, but as a way to kind of eliminate competition, if you will. I'm obviously familiar with Instagram, very popular photo sharing service. Uh, some concern that it was going to eat away at, at Facebook's 
kind of business, if you will. Uh, so acquiring them provided that particular way of, of eliminating a competitor, which is something also that you can use to, or to uh, a merger and acquisition for. All right. Uh, now, we obviously talked about how businesses get bigger and bigger and how they expand into new markets. But what if they don't? What if they want to get out of certain markets? And that's, an, that's a, a, a certainly a, a potential to come up. And what can happen is you can do a couple of different things. And I'll give you some examples of how these have worked. Um, first we see is that divestiture. Okay? Uh, divestiture is basically transferring uh, either total or complete or partial ownership of a company's operations to investors or to another company. Okay? So essentially you are getting out of a certain business. You're eliminating it completely. Okay, whether whereas investing means that I am getting into an industry, I am investing in stocks, so I'm acquiring stocks. Divest, divesting or divestiture would mean I am removing myself from that position. Okay, and there are a couple of examples of divestitures. Uh, first off, you have a spinoff. Okay, uh, a spinoff is setting up a basically a, a division or part of a business as a separate company. Okay, so if you remember in 2011, uh, HP Hewlett Packard said they were going to potentially explore spinning off their PC division. So they would take the PC business that's part of Hewlett Packard and then establish it as a separate company altogether. Okay, um, got a lot of flack for that. Didn't end up happening, um, but people can explore that as an option. Okay, uh, more recently in 2012. The uh, publishing company News Corp um, is talked about, or not publishing company, but media company News Corp, which owns uh, like publishing companies. They own the Wall Street Journal, they own Fox News, and all these other places. And Fox um, has talked about spinning off their their publishing business, right? Their media, right? The Wall Street Journal, and all those other places. Um, as a way of eliminating a maybe not so high of a growth business, if you will. Um, because what you know about news, obviously, especially paper news publishing, is that readership's gone down, advertising dollars are going away, and so it's not as attractive as a business. They don't grow as fast. Um, but News Corp also owns movie studios, and those are actually doing quite well. And so in order to offer investors a very attractive return, something more aggressive, a little more risky. They want to have a separate investment here with all of their uh, movie studio opportunities and those types of things, but also keep another investment opportunity here for someone who maybe doesn't want as much risk, looking for a little bit lower of a return. They can invest in the publishing side, of course, as well. That's kind of the reason why companies explore that it's because they want to offer different opportunities to investors and together maybe it's not as attractive as an investment but separately now you're catering to two different groups next thing you have is a carve out a carve out very similar to a spin-off uh, the only difference is in a spin-off you actually will um, offer current shareholders shares in the new company Okay, so let's say if I own stock in HP and HP decides to spin off their PC business, well, now I own, you know, st I still own stock in HP, but now I'm granted shares in this new company. In a carve out, um, you're not granted shares. They're actually issued on the open market, uh, essentially sold, and if you want them, you can purchase them, but they're not going to come to you and say, hey, we want to give you these particular shares or anything like that. So they, they serve the same purpose, but the mechanics are just a little bit different. All right, a couple of examples here. I talked about HP and obviously the fiasco that they went through and potentially uh, getting rid of their PC business, which... Um, actually brought in a majority of their revenue, so they, they didn't take them too long to figure out that that wasn't a good idea. Uh, but more recently, in 2011, uh, there was a big fiasco with Netflix. And for those of you that remember our Netflix subscribers, uh, you'll notice that there was a, uh, the summer of 2011 was a very tumultuous time for Netflix. Reed Hastings, who's the CEO, uh, came out and said that he was going to be uh, exploring, spinning off the DVD business 
from Netflix into a separate company called Quickster. There'd be a separate website, separate login. The streaming company they felt was going to be the kind of the future. They wanted to invest heavily in that and wanted to de-emphasize the DVD mail order business, which is what they kind of built their popularity on. Uh, and people came out and were very, very frustrated and upset with that. Uh, and so you saw Netflix during that time do a complete 180 and change stance on that. And just because of the backlash that they received as a result of trying to spin off their DVD business into uh, what would have been Quickster, but what never really uh, came to fruition, of course. So uh, another example of how companies utilize spinoffs or at least intend to, but maybe not really work out so much. All right, now we're going to get into uh, franchising. Now, I, before I go into this, I, I wasn't necessarily fond of how franchising is is lumped together with uh, with the formations of business because it isn't a form of ownership. Okay, uh, it's a it's a type of business. Okay, so don't group it in the same bucket as a sole proprietorship, partnership, LLC. Uh, because those are forms of business ownership. A franchise is an actual business model. It's a type of business, if you will. Uh, once we get into entrepreneurship, we're going to talk about some of the different ways you can start a business, like buying an existing business, uh, starting one from scratch on your own. One of those is franchising. That's a legitimate business model, something that you can explore. And it provides a number of different benefits. Uh, so franchising pairs two people has the franchisor, let's say McDonald's, for example, one of the most popular and recognizable franchises, uh, with the franchisee, which is people like me and you, people that want to maybe buy into a business, don't want to start one from scratch because we're just not quite sure we don't have a good idea, uh, but we want to buy something established that we know works. Well, McDonald's for sure works. They've been around for decades. They've done very well. They've been able to diversify into different offerings and be a little more health conscious so they don't uh, don't get blamed for the entire obesity of, uh, of America. Uh, so let's say you want to start a franchise and you want to explore a McDonald's franchise. Okay, uh, What you'll do is you'll sign what's called a franchising agreement. And so what that franchising agreement does is it's a contract. And it binds McDonald's to certain things, and it binds you to certain things, right? Uh, and so it's essentially an agreement where, in return, you're going to pay fees to McDonald's to use their name, to use their methods of operation, and all those different things. In return, McDonald's is going to allow you to use their symbols like the golden arches to have access to their secret sauce to go through hamburger university which is their training program so they're going to give you all of the materials they're going to help you select a place to put the mcdonald's restaurant they're going to acquire the land they're going to do all these things to help you out in return you're going to pay them money okay and they're going to get to grow their particular company so let's look at more how this works so uh, the first thing is what does McDonald's get? Well, they get a franchising fee. This is a one-time fee that you pay to the franchise or, and it depends on uh, really what business you're doing. You can get in some franchises where you're paying, you know, maybe five, ten thousand dollars Others, you're paying upwards of, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, depending upon the location and how established and recognizable that franchise is. Um, so there's the franchise fee, that upfront payment. And you also have royalty payments. This is typically a percentage of sales. And usually this is ongoing. Uh, so depending upon a certain month, however many sales you do, that's computed based upon the percentage. And that's what you have to pay to the franchisor. So that's what McDonald's would receive from you or I if we were to start a franchise and if we were to continue to operate. They also get growth. And they get expansion. Right? Every time someone starts a franchise and McDonald's approves of them to be a franchisee, that's another McDonald's somewhere. And so they go in and find out what's the best location, what would get the best, uh, kind of the uh, most street traffic, you know, high populated areas. Uh, so what would be recognizable, and that gives them another McDonald's restaurant, and they can expand. All the while, you're doing all the work. You're doing the operations. They're just getting a little bit of a cut from it. Now, for you, 
you get access to the trademarks and operating procedures. And this is important, right? Because if you try to open up a hamburger restaurant, chances are it's not going to be as established and recognizable as a McDonald's is because McDonald's has been around for decades. They have an established brand. When you go to a McDonald's, whether you're in uh, Fresno, California, or if you're in somewhere in New York, you know what you're going to get. You know what to expect. And so that is a benefit that you want to take advantage of. Okay. You also get to take advantage of the way they operate, right? How they train employees, how to assemble the hamburgers. You know, it's very, very specific process. If you've ever worked uh, for a uh, franchised company or worked for McDonald's, you'll know just how many rules there are and how many different ways there are of doing specific things. And they iron these things out very specifically because McDonald's is about consistency. You want to get the same experience whether you go to McDonald's in Fresno or the one in New York. And if they're different, well, that's going to that's gonna hurt the brand. So that's not going to be a good thing. And so that's why franchisers have a lot of different guidelines and different rules that you have to follow because they want to make sure that whatever you do isn't going to hurt their brand. All right, and I mentioned before you get training. Okay, uh, franchisors obviously want to make sure you have all the tools necessary to run the business successfully because obviously if you're using their logo, that's a reflection of them. So they want to make sure that you obviously represent them in the most positive light, that you're going to be successful, and that you're going to be making them lots and lots of money. All right, now what are some of the advantages and disadvantages? of franchising. We've kind of gone over these a little bit, but just to rehash, just so you have something for your notes that's nice and compact, feel free and jot these down and make some notations. Uh, first, the advantages. Uh, it's less risk. And the reason for that is you're buying an established business. You don't have to worry about if there's a market for it. You don't have to worry if people are going to like it. You don't have to worry about if it's priced right. With a franchise, typically you know it is, at least if it's a recognizable franchise, one that's been around a while. Now, obviously you can find franchises that aren't very successful and you have to look at their uh, records and different things and performance to see if it's something that you want to get into. But if you're sticking with a, uh, like a company like McDonald's, well, you know it's been around a while. You know people know about that business and will continue to patronize them uh, from now until probably forever. Um, so it is less risky from that regard. You also get the training and support. Okay, Like I said before, McDonald's will put you through that hamburger university. You go through all the different steps. You learn how to run the business from the marketing side and all these other things. Uh, so you're going to get the support you need to continue to operate and be successful. You also have brand recognition. Instantly, everyone knows what you do and what you sell. You don't have to do an ad campaign. You don't have to go out and you know, uh, walk through neighborhoods and, and pass out flyers to educate people on what who you are and what you do. People know who you are and what you do already, which is a certain benefit. And the next you have access to funding. Okay, if you were to go to banks to try to get a bank loan, if you were to say, you know what, I'm starting a McDonald's, that carries more weight because it's more recognizable, right? The business model is proven. If you go in and say, I have this really good idea, that uh, I really want to reinvent the VCR industry. You know, I think it's just prime to be repositioned and we can bring this back and it's going to be great. You know, some of you probably have never even used a VCR. And so that probably wouldn't be a very good business model. That wouldn't be very smart. And so the bank would probably turn you down. At least they should. I don't know for sure, but they should. Uh, so that's access to funding is, defi dis is a definite di advantage for a franchise. Now disadvantages, costs, very significant. You have that franchise fee and then you also have those continued royalty payments. That is a significant disadvantage because that's money that's leaving. That's the trade-off, right? You're trying to pay for that brand recognition. It's not going to come cheap though. Okay. Uh, lack of control. And what I mean by that is if you're a franchisee, you have to adhere to all the different rules and guidelines of the franchisor. They don't want you doing your own thing. They don't want you establishing your own marketing materials. Uh, they don't want you inventing new hamburgers or changing the recipe up. They want it done a specific way because that's how it's always been done and that's how all the other restaurants perform. 
So you don't have a lot of control in that regard. You know, the business model is there. You basically follow the guidelines to a T, and then that's it. Uh, you can also suffer from what's called a negative halo effect. Um, some of you might not remember, but in the early 90s, uh, there was a big issue with Jack in the Box. I believe it was up in Washington where uh, a uh, uh, someone unfortunately died as a result of eating a, a hamburger that wasn't cooked all the way through. And that spread to a, really a lot of the other Jack in the Box franchises. Even though they were located far away, it was an isolated incident. That issue really spread to the other franchises. And so that's what's called a negative halo effect, is that a bad thing in one area kind of spreads itself uh, to all the other areas. And even though there isn't a connection and there, there's no link between the two, people still in their minds will say, well, that's a Jack in the Box. They obviously had some problems uh, with preparing, you know, properly cooked meat before, I'm not going to chance it. I'm just going to go somewhere else. Uh, so that's what you can suffer from. It's very similar to, or it's very common in interviewing. If you've ever done any type of interviewing, um, it's a very big bias is the negative halo effect where that's commonly referred to as the horns effect also is you pick out one negative quality about a person and all of a sudden that's the only thing you can see and you write them off completely. Maybe you're a big sports fan and you like the San Francisco 49ers like I do and somebody walks in and they're wearing a Oakland Raiders you know, jersey, which kind of a segue, obviously don't wear NFL apparel to an interview. You probably want to wear business casual and or maybe even a suit uh, for men that is. Um, so don't wear NFL apparel to interviews. Uh, off topic, but I, I have to go there just to be thorough. So let's just say you did though. Just, just for the heck of it. Uh, and I'm a San Francisco 49ers fan. You show up in an Oakland Raiders jersey. And now I just just think you're just the lowest life. Just You can't do the job. Ah, oh, this person's not going to work out. Because I attributed that one quality to everything about you. Right? That's a bias. That's not accurate necessarily. So the same thing happens with companies, of course. If bad press happens with one company or with one particular restaurant, it tends to spread to all the other restaurants in the company. Okay? Uh, there are also growth challenges uh, sometimes. Uh, depending upon the company, you may have uh, chosen to go with a company that's in a declining industry, uh, in an industry that's no longer really present uh, on the decline, and that can present some challenges. Okay? Uh, you do have some restrictions on sales, of course. Um, you obviously only want to be selling certain things. You, know, you do have to check with the corporate office and all those other things. Uh, and then poor execution as well. Um, that can be a disadvantage from franchises, but you know that really poor execution is something that happens regardless if you're in a franchise or not. So um, even if you have a McDonald's franchise or you start your own business or you purchase an existing one, um, still it's going to rely on you to actually execute day in, day out to serve your customers and all those other things. Uh, so that may not be necessarily isolated to solely franchises. All right, well, that concludes our lecture here on business formation. Okay, hopefully, I uh, answered some of your questions with regards to some of the different nuances between the different types of ownership and types of formation. Uh, if you have questions, which is completely understandable, you know, it isn't reasonable to think that I can possibly review everything I need to in 60 minutes, uh, usually during the uh, during lecture for, for my face-to-face -face classes, usually we're, we're taking about three class periods, so about uh, just shy of three hours uh, to go through all this material here and make sure there's a solid understanding from the group. So uh, if you find yourself with questions, anything, feel free and let me know. Otherwise, thanks for joining. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.